hope everyone enjoyed their lunch, and I uh, apologize for the entertainment. Uh, thank you, Jim, for putting that together. That was excellent. Um, we have two speakers here uh, this afternoon uh, that are going to educate us. Um, the first is uh, Mr. James Crocker. Uh, he is the uh, Vice President and General Manager of the Sensing and Exploration Systems at uh, Lockheed Martin uh, Space Systems Company. <laughs> Uh, in, in his past career, he's uh, been a program director uh, for the take my notes here Next Generation Space Telescope at uh, Ball Aerospace and Technologies Corporation. Um, he has a lot of experience with NASA, though, even going back to his days at uh, University of Alabama Huntsville, where he did some design work uh, for Skylab. Uh, he's won numerous numerous awards, uh, including the uh, Space Telescope uh, Science Institute uh, Out Outstanding Achievement Award and two NASA Public Service Awards. So uh, please join me in welcoming James Crocker. Teflon and Tang, two of the famous uh, spinoffs of NASA space exploration, not. And we all know that there are enormous number of spinoffs of space exploration, but Tang and Teflon, I'm sure you know, were not one of them, or two of them. A lot of uh, myth goes into what we do in space exploration, and a lot of myth goes into things, and sometimes the things that are true get lost with, and trivial get lost with the important things. And one of the important things, I think the most important contribution that NASA has made was in the area of systems engineering. NASA didn't invent systems engineering, but certainly in the time that we ran up to going to the moon, and since then, NASA has developed this to a state of the art far beyond what industry had before then. And when you think about it, it was the perfect opportunity. Think about the first thing we do in systems engineering is we really set the high level requirements. And who set those for going to the moon? Well, it certainly came, I don't know who actually wrote the speech for Mr. Kennedy, President Kennedy, but when he said to put a human on the moon before the deck gets out and return him safely to the earth, I think you see the perfect systems engineering high-level requirements. We're going to do it in a time frame that's defined. What are we going to do? We're going to put a human on to land a human on the moon, and most importantly, at least for that human and his family, bring them back safely to Earth. Uh, systems requirements at that level were part of what laid out the opportunity for us to, in fact, get to the moon before the end of the decade and return the astronauts home safe. So, can you teach systems engineering? Well, absolutely you can teach systems engineering. That's what you're doing. But teaching something and have people get something aren't necessarily the same thing. And one of the things I've observed is that uh, systems engineering is, is special. It's different from many of the disciplines that, that many of us have. I'm, I'm an electrical engineer by an undergraduate degree in um, I know about electrical engineering. Many of you are probably mechanical engineers or software engineers. Uh, and it takes a certain uh, mindset to do engineering. Typically, most of us who go into engineering go very deep into a field. We really know electrical engineering or some subset today, communications engineering or whatever. But to do systems engineering really takes a person who can not only go deep, but who can go very broad. Heard of a, you know, a mile deep, and an inch wide. Systems engineers have to be a mile deep and 10 miles wide. Uh, I, I know you know that. But more than that, systems engineers have to do something else. Systems engineers have to be leaders and communicators. And, and, and that's not something I think that comes natural to many engineers. And so we either have to learn those skills or we have to have a, at least a natural ability that some of those things out. So, so why is that important? Well, I think it's important because of a story that's at least 800 years old. And that 800-year-old story, I tried to, I, I first heard this story in a book called The Mythical Man Month. It was written about the IBM 360 computer and the operating system that was written for that at the time, the largest piece of software ever developed for anything. And in that story is a story of some stone cutters and uh, and a traveler who, 800 years ago, as the story goes, came up to Avignon, France on a uh, misty day and was rushing to a meeting. But he was uh, 
interested in three stone cutters who were working in front of this, uh, this project. And he asked the first one what he was doing, and the guy sort of grumbled and said, I'm you know, cutting stone. You know, get away. Don't bother cutting stone. So he went up to the second stone mason. He said, so could you tell me, sir, what you're doing? He said, I'm being the best stone mason in the county. And if I work really hard, I can be the best stone maker in the entire country. He went up to a third stone mason who was just as intent on the carving and the work that he was doing. And he asked him what he was doing. And this stone mason stopped put down his hammer and chisel, and stepped back, and with maybe a tear, but great pride, he looked up and he said, I'm building a cathedral, a cathedral that will stand to the glory of God for the next several centuries. You see, that's what systems engineers do. Systems engineers build cathedrals. When you look back over history, and you look at the great uh, things that have been accomplished, things that come to mind like the pyramids, things that come to mind uh, like uh, going to the moon, the International Space Station. You look at the great achievements, the Hubble Space Telescope, and the people who built that were building cathedrals. They may have been, in the case of NASA, cathedrals of the sky, but cathedrals no less. And the essence I've learned over the years of doing that, of building that cathedral, lays at the heart of systems engineering. Today I'm, I'm going to talk about a couple of stories. and uh, It's been my experience that you can teach the tools of systems engineering, and, and that's a necessary part of the foundation. But to actually do systems engineering, you, you got to go do it. It's not something that you can simulate. It's something that you, you learn by doing the, the the basic foundational principles of systems engineering can be learned by all of us, by anyone. Actually conducting systems engineering, the art of systems engineering, the art and science of systems engineering come by doing. I, I say this all the time. In my career, I've seen over and over and over the uh, confusion of, of doing systems engineering with using the tools of systems engineering. It takes both. But you can't confuse one with the other, as many, many of you know. So communication and leadership skills are important. That basic engineering understanding, a broad understanding of engineering and, and the disciplines that are involved are important. There's uh, a couple of other things that are important, too. When I was uh, studying a management, program management school, I noticed that they always form a project office with a program manager, a scheduler, a finance and business operation person, and a systems engineer. That's kind of, you can be a little larger or smaller. You might throw a contracts person in there, too. But, but that's the essence of the program office, right? But of all of those, there's this symbiotic relationship between the systems engineer and the program manager that I found to be extraordinarily deep and extraordinarily important when you're trying to get a cathedral built. And that is this, this uh, demarcation and this push-pull between the program manager and the systems engineer in a, in a project that, uh, if done right, will lead you to success, and if done wrong, will lead you down some very interesting roads and highways. In, in my experience, the purpose of the program manager is very similar to the purpose of the systems engineer, but they're a bit of an antithesis with each other. The, the program manager is to get the program done on time and on schedule. That, that's their fundamental job. The systems engineer is to make sure that all of those things are done, but also that this thing works. And there's a great book called Launch Systems Failures. It, it details every uh, failure of every launch of satellite system going back to uh, Sputnik. And, and in that, as I read it, the thing that struck my mind about this book is that with rare exception, a failure of a system is a failure in systems engineering. It's either a failure of analysis, it's a failure of requirements understanding. I mean, you can go through and, and just tick it off. 
this system failed because somebody did not understand the requirement or it didn't get flowed down properly. This system failed because we didn't test as we fly or fly like we test. Some requirement wasn't understood. So this is about communication and it's about leadership and understanding that dynamic and not having uh, either the systems engineer overpower the program manager or the program manager overpower the systems engineer is, I think, critical to what is so important today, which is delivering what was asked for that works on time and on schedule. If either of the systems engineer or the program manager overpowers the other, you'll come in on the wrong side of that equation. You may get something <coughs> that's phenomenal, eye-watering technically. It may do a million things extremely well. It may have a huge amount of margin. It just may take forever and cost an infinite amount of money. And today, of course we never have, but today particularly we don't have an infinite amount of time and money. On the other hand, if the, if the program manager side of the brain gets too much engaged, you can deliver on cost and on schedule, and you can have system failures. A lot of people talk about faster, better, cheaper, and that it was a failure. No, it wasn't. If you look, in fact, at what uh, Dan Golden said, he said, you know, we're going to do more projects, we will have more failures, but at the end of the day, we will have achieved more. If you look at the statistics, the statistics on that were exactly what Dan Golden said they would be. He said, you know, we're going to probably lose three of ten, but we'll do ten rather than five. So that led to, but in that mentality, program managers drove costs down. There, there was no, uh, there was no place where you could say good enough on cost. It was, you know, cheaper, 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 cheaper. And we got to a point where we pushed ourselves off a cliff, perhaps. But still, we did seven out of ten. So, so you gotta understand that dichotomy and that brain between the program manager and the systems engineer, and getting that balance right, in my experience, is the single most important thing that systems engineers <coughs> do for the success of the program. So I'm gonna stop the theory and go to a couple of, uh, uh, let me get, uh, uh, I'll get this one to start. So, I'm going to tell you two uh, stories, because I think that stories about systems engineering are, are the best way to learn about systems engineering. I'm going to tell you two of my stories, two of my experiences, uh, and then we'll talk about them, see what you think, maybe how things could have worked out differently. The first story I'm going to tell you about is this one. Uh, some of you were here and some of you weren't here in the day that we got the first images back from the Hubble Space Telescope. I was up at Johns Hopkins at the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute and the images came back down and they were supposed to look like the ones on this side, on my side, and the images looked like images on the left side. Uh, the Marshall team was down. They were thinking, well, we're just not focused. If we can you know, it must be some alignment problem, worked and worked and worked. And the more people worked, the more they realized there was something fundamentally wrong. Uh, I was down in the basement of the Science Institute sitting with Dr. Chris Burroughs. Chris is an interesting guy. Uh, Chris uh, was an uh, ESA. There's about 15% ESA membership up at the Space Telescope Science Institute at that time. And uh, Chris uh, was an engineer, but I was an astronomer. And, astrophysicist actually, uh, but Ricardo, the director, said you need to learn some technical things, so he gave him Born and Wolf, and Chris went back and read it on optics uh, over the weekend, he came back and Ricardo said, you finished it already? And he said, yeah. And he said, uh, so what do you think? He said, well, on page 247, the guy's really wrong, he derived this incorrectly, so you can understand, Chris really knew stuff. He was, uh, I think, the youngest uh, PhD at Cambridge uh, since Isaac Newton. So Chris had written this program, and um, I said, so what are you looking at? He said, well, I've just analyzed some things, and there's a fundamental flaw in the mirror. Basically, the mirror, I think, has spherical aberration in it. Well, this is the first I've heard about spherical aberration in the telescope, and uh, it was a 
So I said, so what do you do about it? Chris said, well, there's nothing you can do about it. It's built into the mirror, and you can't adjust it out. Uh, those were dark days for a lot of us. Uh, it, uh, it resonated with the country. And the Hubble Space Telescope had been, I don't want to say hype, but certainly anticipated. Uh, the day before launch, uh, Brian Gummel had been down. They did a special broadcast. It, uh, everybody was looking forward to Hubble. You know, people in the general public like astronomy and telescopes. They can understand it. They can see the pictures. And so this was, this was going to be discovering the secrets of the universe. And so when it became apparent that there was a fundamental flaw in the system, uh, this was the type of uh, press that NASA was getting. And uh, it was not fun to be part of the Hubble Space Telescope program at that time for any of us in academia, where I was at the time, or industry, or, uh, or in the government, certainly. Um, you remember, this was coming, uh, coming on the heels. We had, this was the second return to flight after the first uh, shuttle accident. Uh, people were thinking, NASA's lost their way. They just can't do the big thing anymore. And I would say systems engineering would be at the heart of that. So being, being a systems engineer, that kind of struck really close to me. So what do you do about that? Well, interestingly, uh, some uh, uh, Dr. Holland Ford at Hopkins and Dr. Bob Brown said, well, you know, there's a lot of us who spent our life working on the Hubble Space Telescope. We should put a team of people together, industry, NASA, academia, uh, and let's go broad. I mean, uh, ESA's 15% of this. Let's go get Europeans. Let's get the best engineers, op opticians, everybody in the world. And let's go systems engineer this thing. Let's figure out how to fix it. We're not going to, uh, or as Gene Kranz would say, failure here is not an option. We've all invested too much of our lives and careers in this mission. To, to possibly not do everything we can to see how to fix it. Well, in fact, there was a path already going down. JPL had, was building the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2, which was a replacement for the one on board, and it was uh, serendipitously uh, fairly straightforward to make a correction in the Wide Field Planetary 2 instrument to uh, cancel out the, uh, the error that was made in the mirror. Mirror was, in essence, as I'm sure all of you know, was ground incorrectly because the tool used to make the telescope was uh, make the mirror had been set up incorrectly. So you can take a six-inch ruler that's incorrect, and you can cut a six-inch board all day long, and you will cut it wrong. And that's exactly what they did. They cut, 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 check, cut, check, but they were using the wrong tool to do it. So uh, this. Uh, Charlie Pellerin thought this was a really good idea. Charlie ran the, uh, uh, was the associate administrator for, for space science at the time. And Charlie uh, supported this, he funded this, and, and we had several meetings to go out and figure it out. Now, it was a, a pretty uh, interesting approach. Uh, this document, actually I Googled it, you can get it online now, uh, uh, talks about the uh, process, the systems engineering process, and the creative process that was uh, put together. And I think what uh, we, we finally got to a solution, um, and it was a, a bigger solution than just replace the wide field. You see, astronomers were on this committee as well. And what the astronomers knew was you can't do astronomy and astrophysics with just an imager. You have to have a spectrograph. The science comes as much or more from the spectrograph than from the imager. So had we rushed up and just put the Wide Field Planetary 2 replacement in on the first servicing mission, changed those two instruments out, we would have maybe had a PR success, but we would not have had a scientific success. So how do you fix all the instruments was the problem. Um, so uh, the first thing that we did was all of the, the, the team really focused on the optical solution. It was an optical problem, so we got locked onto the optical solution. Peter Drucker, who's a great management guru, said it's more important to be doing the right thing than to be doing things right. Now, at the end of the day, you have to do both. We weren't doing the right thing. You would think, from a systems engineering perspective, that, well, you focus on the optical solution. When I walked in the room the first day, I looked around, and I knew some of the people in the room were imminent 
uh, optical engineers from Europe, uh, uh, from the U.S., people from JPL, and I thought, man, you know, I'm an electrical engineer, I know a little bit about optics, but I'm not going to be able to work on that problem, so I'm, I'm going to think about a different problem that maybe I can work on. But they did a phenomenal job. They basically did all the math. They said, you know, there's three places we can fix this. We can fix it in the far field we, by putting some sort of corrector plate in front of the telescope. We can correct it in the near field. There's something between the primary and the secondary. And you get three plates, and here's this elegant three-plate solution that will allow you to, to correct the aberration. We can do it in the instrument field, either like the white field, planetary camera two, where we correct something in the instrument. Or we can actually do something in front of the instrument. And in fact, it was a Dr. Rambatama uh, at Ball Aerospace who had this rather interesting design for a two-mirror corrector system. But the problem was, we also had an astronaut, Bruce McCandless, who was on this committee. And as we put these ideas forth and ran the math and showed the sensitivity to thermal and vibration of all these different designs, and got the best one for this, they turned to Bruce and said, so Bruce, how would we put this in the telescope? Uh, McCandless, uh, as you probably know, was on the first deployment mission, but Bruce had worked on making sure the telescope was serviceable and how to do things for, for really 10 years before uh, the telescope, more than that, before the telescope was launched. So Bruce knew the Hubble Space Telescope intimately, and Bruce would say, as any astronaut, would say, well, I can do that, but they won't let me. They won't let me because it's too fragile to carry up in the shuttle, or they won't let me because it'll, it'll place the crew at risk, or, you know, you're going to ask me to go down the barrel of this telescope, and, you know, they're going to be worried that I'm going to snag my suit or can't get out, so I can't do it. So the very first time Bruce said that, I said, ah, oh, I know what I'm going to work on. I'm going to think about not the fix or which of the fixes that have been proposed, which are about 30 or 40, all of which would work theoretically. I'm going to think about how would you do the fix, and I'm going to do my trades based on which one of these you are easier or actually possible to do. So as I went down that route, there was another problem. So we had all these trades. We had done all the, the trades on what was the best optical solution. I started doing trades on, okay, which ones were implementable, and the problem was none of them. Not a single one of the ideas that had been put forth were doable. The corrector plate, which everybody loved on the front, I mean, it was just, I don't know, three meter in diameter, quarter inch uh, thick uh, magnesium fluoride. I mean, how hard could that be to build and then carry up on a, a shuttle without breaking it and figuring out how to put it in place? So each one of these, I, I went through. Uh, we ha I had built models of the focal plane out of styrofoam. I'm, I'm a really great model guy when I think about things. I like to see them. Built, built things and so it's going on and on and couldn't figure out how to do it. Uh, had an epiphany in a shower in Munich uh, where we were having the last meeting uh, where the maid has actually left the, you know these showers in Europe, they go up and down and they on the little rods and slide up and down. You see them here now but in the day I, it's kind of unique. And so I did this and slipped it out, and when I did, I, I, it just dawned on me that I had to get into a different thinking space to solve this problem. And the different thinking space was, what if we sacrifice one of the instruments? Because if we, there are four instruments in the aft shroud of Hubble. If we sacrifice the least usable, the one most effective, which would be the high-speed photometer, we could put a new instrument in, and all those optics could be in that instrument, and then just like that shower, they could deploy out and put the corrective optics in front of the other instruments. So that's, this is what, because I built these models, I knew that the focal plane of the telescope, where these four telephone booth sized instruments came together, was really only about the size of a, of a, of a large pizza. And all of the apertures for each one of the instruments were fairly close together, I mean, within an area about this big. So if we took one of the instruments out, packaged these optics in it, put the instrument back in, it could then flip out these corrective optics in front of the other instruments. And when I put the chart up, McCandless's face got really, he said, that'll work. He said, that'll work because that's the way we designed the system to be serviced. 
So what we had done was we had all been <coughs> focused on the optical solution, which wasn't the problem. The problem was different. The problem was how do you get the correction into the telescope? And that's, that came up with the idea of CoStar. And uh, as a matter of fact, if you walk down the block just a few, um, a few blocks and go to the Smithsonian, this is a picture of CoStar now deployed over in the Smithsonian. Because on the last servicing mission, when we took the last instrument out, all of the new instruments had this CoStar correction built into them. So we don't need CoStar anymore. Taking it someplace, I'm not sure where. Taking it someplace? Yeah, I was just down there the week before last. Oh, they're going to move it over to where the telescope is. Yeah, they've got it packed up. So they got it packed up. Okay, so you can't look at it. Uh, but, so, so that was kind of one thing. So the, the first lesson I got from this is uh, make sure you're solving the right problem. It's so easy to get locked into solving a problem that you know how to solve. It's sort of like, you know, when you lose your contacts or you lose something and it's dark, you want to go look for it by a street light. It, it's really easy to get locked into doing something that you know how to do as opposed to solving the, the real systems engineering problem in trade of, of understanding what the real problem is. And so that was the lesson to me from, from, from CoStar. The other thing is one about leadership and salesmanship. When we proposed this idea, we all thought, I mean, it was so hard to get here. We thought it was, uh, we thought it was just the obvious solution. When we tried to sell that, we got a million reasons why you should. And the one that was the most powerful, the one I had to think about the most was, well, wait a minute, if you put this in the telescope and you deploy all these arms and you can't get it out of the telescope on the next service mission, we've not only lost, or it doesn't work, we've not only lost this instrument, we've lost all the actual instruments. So we, we we thought about all of the, the secondary implications, the unintended consequences of putting CoStar in. And we had a simple solution, and that was the, by s some simple design features, we eliminated that problem. Number one, each of these arms naturally would have a dual redundant motor to deploy it or stow it. But if both of those fail, there's a little shoe here and when you retract the tower, those little shoes flip each one of the mirrors up. And then somebody we knew would say, well, so what if you can't retract the tower? We said, we'll have a dual winding on the motor, but on top of that, there's a 7 16th inch bolt. That's what the astronauts use to actually install all these instruments. You run that bolt back, it turns the whole motor arm not the motor itself, but the whole casing. So even if the bearings are frozen up, it would pull this back. So we had anticipated um, what the objections would be, and we had simple, I mean, this didn't add anything to the design on the front end. Putting a shoe on this on the front end costs nothing. Putting a uh, 7 16 inch retraction that will pull the whole thing back when you're doing the design really was a design issue. It costs nothing. So it added nothing. Now, to do it on the other end would have been enormously expensive, so we had thought about that. So, as I think all of you know, the Whitefield Planetary Camera was successfully installed along with CoStar on the first servicing mission. I think we did this in 30-some-odd uh, 30, 30 months from the time we started until the time we, we got it done. But to me, it was uh, the two big lessons that I learned personally out of this were, number one, it's more important to be doing the right thing than to be doing things right. At the end of the day, you have to do both. But if you're not working on the right problem, you will never get to the right solution. <coughs> and then secondly, part of systems engineering, particularly a new approach to doing something, you really have to think through this whole thing to the end. What are the objections going to be? Not only from a technical, but from risk, particularly from risk, and this also uh, the political environment that you're working in. NASA at the time could not afford a failure. We could not go up and service the Hubble Space Telescope and fail. I mean, quite literally, the, the, uh, the, the, the we were betting the agency that this would be successful. Three, three strikes and you're out. I mean, if we, could, if we were not successful, or even the perception of not being successful, it, it could have been a very bad day. 
So that's CodeStar, and uh, we, uh, of course, it was installed on the uh, on the first servicing mission. Uh, KT was able to use the standard procedures to go in. Uh, she pulled the old uh, high-speed photometer out, installed uh, CoStar, uh, deployed it, everything come, came up, and it worked because this was the way it was designed to be serviced. So we took advantage of a built-in design feature. And then uh, on the last uh, servicing mission that we just completed, uh, CoStar was removed, and the uh, Cosmic Orbit Spectrograph installed in its place. And now, for the first time, we have the real power of Hubble all five of the science instruments are working on Hubble and returning uh, phenomenal research. Let me tell you about one other interesting story, and it's about, I'll be brief on this, I want to talk just a little bit about the James Webb Space Telescope. I could spend a lot of time talking about Webb, but let me just tell you one story. Uh, the challenge with Webb, the challenge with the James Webb Space Telescope, fundamentally was how do you package a cryogenic uh, at the time, eight meter telescope uh, for launch in such a way that you can reliably deploy it at the end of the day. And there were several designs. I won't go into all of them, but there were three kind of fundamental designs at the end of the day. One was called the hard, which was uh, hexagons that kind of you know un unfolded. Uh, one would flip over, another would flip over, and you stack them like potato chips. The interesting thing about that approach was that was the most volume efficient way to package uh, uh, an optic. Basically, you stack them like potato chips and then pour it in and fold. Uh, there was another one that was interesting, and basically, you know, mirrors are, are mirrors. Another that was uh, interesting was basically uh, one that was a kind of popular design. It's never been flown, but people basically took the mirror and they broke it into a fold up, fold down pedal. So that was the fold up, fold down pedal approach. That's pretty good. I mean, basically, you get up there, the, the secondary mirror is fixed on the tower, and basically you fold these two up and these two back, and you got a mirror. And that was kind of the kind of preferred thinking of the design. Um, there's two problems with that. I mean, one is uh, you've got, actually it was, it was uh, three paddles up and three down, so you got six deployments. And if any one of them fails, uh, you, you have a problem. With the hard approach, the hexagon approach, I think there were 38 deployments that you had to do. So I'm using this paper plate because the late Wally Meyer from Ball and Bob Woodruff, uh, who was a, a, a fabulous optical designer, and myself were sitting in the back of the room up at Goddard when they were having the industry day and were thinking about this. And we were thinking, okay, we know a lot about the requirements for this telescope. We have to quit thinking about what's the way you fold it and think about, you know, What's the, right, what's the right way to be thinking about this problem? And it's really twofold. The, the two biggest problems you have to solve were number one, how do you fold it so that you can deploy it the most reliably with the fewest number of deployments, number one. And number two, this is a cryogenic telescope. It operates at, you know, in the, in the uh, several, uh, few tens of Kelvin degrees. And so the other problem is going to be the, the thermal connectivity of the back plane. You get a degree or two difference across the back plane because of its conductivity. It's not going to hold its uh, hold shape. So there were some pipe lights. You know how hard it is to find these today? It's, you know, these are in the back of the room at, 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 uh, at uh, Goddard. At the time. So I, I went up and picked up a pipe plate and I said, you know, Wally, if we fold it like it's table, like one of these drop leaf tables, then, uh, and as a matter of fact, if this is the reflective surface, and then the, the secondary is on a three-bar linkage, then to really get a really good uh, a four by eight meter telescope, you just get one deployment. Basically, the secondary has got to flip down. And then, if the two wings do deploy, then you've got a, a full eight meter telescope, and you've done it with three deployments, and that was like half of anything else. But the most important thing was every other design tore the back plane. And when you tear a back plane, you gotta put the therm thermal conductivity back together. So you're dependent on some sort of connection now that you gotta remake for the thermal conductivity. Whereas if you fold it, you don't have to tear the back plane. 
And you can even imagine having a copper strip down the, the fold here so that you, you have a continuous uh, thermal backplane uh, across. So, so in essence, although uh, uh, Ball teamed with TRW and this sort of thing, that, 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 that concept of the design actually survived. And so when you look at the James Webb Space Telescope today, you'll see this, uh, this cord fold, we call it, or drop leaf table fold. And the, and the way we got to that design was thinking about what the real problem was. The, you, here again, if you're designing a telescope, you get locked into the optical design, and you miss the fact that for this application, the optical design was interesting, but the, how to fold it and package it for maximum reliability on deployment, and at the same time, how to get that thermal conductivity of the backplane were the two deep systems engineering requirements. So the thing I learned here again from this is it's more important to be doing the right thing before you do things right. Um, and so both of those were, uh, were really, uh, really uh, great education for me. So you can see how the, the telescope uh, is stowed and uh, uh, basically the uh, three bar linkage deploys the secondary. Once that happens, you've got a really good telescope at that point. I mean, at that point, you've got a, uh, a telescope that uh, uh, actually performed about 80% of spec, and then you uh, deploy the two, uh, two outlying wings and, and you have the whole thing. So uh, systems engineering is an art, and I say it's an art because uh, it's, uh, it's art in the sense of practice. You don't learn to play an instrument by reading books. You learn to play an instrument by playing an instrument. And if you're going to play in an orchestra, you learn to play an instrument by playing with others. And the thing that I like uh, most about these stories is, is that you're playing with others. Uh, it, was, uh, it was not... When you look at both of these in, in retrospect from this side, well, of course, that's the way you but when you look at them from the other side, when you don't know how to go install this thing, uh, it's, uh, it, it's different. It's, 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 it's the best solutions are, well, of course you would do it that way when you figure it out. But trying to figure it out is, is not easy. So getting your mind into a systems engineering approach of what's the right question to do this. <coughs> I think if you just take one thing away from, from what I've told you today, it's uh, more important, or first, I would say, uh, make sure you're doing the right thing, because uh, you can't do the wrong thing right, no matter how hard you try. So with that, I'd, I'd like to spend a few minutes with questions. I'm glad to take, uh, if I stump the, stump the speaker. Uh, is there a mic, do you need a microphone? that thing looks now and you know you, you made pretty light of how hard that thing was to build yeah that okay. over and above the fundamental systems side there was a lot of work that went into trying to figure out just how to make that thing work or whether there wasn't a better way so uh yeah i'll tell you just two quick stories on that the other thing you had to know about costar was you had to have a really deep understanding of what was possible. The optics on this telescope were state of the art. They were as good as engineers could achieve, the laws of physics would allow. Let me just tell you a little story about these optics, which are the size of nickel, dimes, and quarters. Well, the guys assured me that the optics were doable. So, of course, when you come up with an idea, I got asked to be the team leader to go build this thing. So, we put out a contract to HDOS, Kodak, uh, Kodak HDOS, and uh, Utah's to build these optics. We we're going to let, uh, there were, there were uh, three sets. We we're going to let each team start with a different set, and whoever got them first, we would take them. We had to have these optics. Well, they started making these optics, and they couldn't make them. Well, why not? So I fly out there and I start listening to the presentation, and the guy said, Well, it's because they're anamorphic A spheres on a toroidal blank. I said, Okay, so tell me what that means. <laughs> oh, they're potato chips. 
like, oh, okay, so we got to make an optic that's like a, got a different radius of curvature in this direction and in this direction, and we have to polish them to three angstroms RMS surface roughness. I mean, that's like, you know, three atoms out of place. And so they couldn't do it. Well, Frank Cephalina, Frank comes up to me and says, well, you know, there's this little company out in, in uh, uh, California named Tinsley, and I think they can make these optics. So we got a plane, we fly out there, and they said, yeah, we can make those. And I said, well, show us how. I said, we can't. I mean, you can't. Well, we do it in this back room. So we thought, man, this is going to be expensive because we got these other three contracts. So they said, well, give us a, give us a price. Well, they came back and said, well, we'll make them all for, I don't know, 250 million, 250, $250,000. It's like, wait a minute, that's less, than, these guys can't know what they're doing. It's less than what any one of the other vendors is charging us for one optic. Anyway, long story short, they went in the back of the room, they came out, they made all the optics, they did it in, a, in time. All the other three vendors failed. That's how close we were. We hadn't found Tinsley, we wouldn't have been successful. The, the second thing that made this hard was you had to know where the entrance apertures to the other instruments were to 0.1 millimeters. And we're thinking, we're not going to be able to get that accurate enough for drawings. Until I ran into the cafeteria to Olivia Lupin. Olivia was with the high-speed photometer team, the instrument that we were taking out and sacrificing. They were pretty upset with us that we were taking their instrument out and sacrificing and put this in. So I was talking to Olivia, and I don't know how this problem came up. She said, oh, that's not hard. I said, what do you mean it's not hard? She said, ooh, ooh, ooh. And she gets really excited. She said, that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. Said, what, what? Well, the PI, Bob Bless, hired me because I have to know where every one of those apertures are because the high-speed photometer, basically, you're going to be looking at a star with another instrument, and then I have to... I wrote the software to send a command to not only move that star into the high-speed photometer aperture, but to a particular filter in there. She said, I know all of this to a tenth of a millimeter. So I said, oh, you're on our team, Olivia. <laughs> so Olivia came in there. So a lot of this was communication. If we had tried to do this on our own, we would have failed. Seppi at Goddard knew these instrument vendors, had been building all of these instruments. Olivia knew had been working for decades to get all this. So, so uh, uh, how to deploy it, how to get that right, how to get the optics right, uh, how to hold this thermally. So we were, it was, a, it was a real study in communication and reaching out to the industry. But the thing we had was everybody working on that program then and today were, were building a cathedral and everybody really got together to make it work. So this was really hard. It was really hard. We were very fortunate that we were able to uh, pull this together. It really took a, a team of, of uh, an incredible number of people to, to make this work. Um, the question, and, and that's probably real hard to answer, but oftentimes, even throughout history, not just what we're doing in NASA, um, serendipity occurs. You know, stuff happens, and and fixes arise. You know, you mentioned communication. What are some other things that would kind of help foment serendipity? Because it seems like a lot of a lot of success comes out of that. There's a uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more about the serendipity part. Uh, I'll say two things about it. One is uh, there's a wonderful series. There's actually a book. Was also an NPR series called Connections by Burke, and he talked about how uh, uh, coal miners in uh, uh, Wales ended up needing a pump, and because of that, they it really led to the development of the con, uh, internal combustion engine. So you go on, there's these serendipitous things. My experience is, uh, as a matter of fact, there's a, there's a recent book out that actually says the uh, the rise of uh, humans as a species actually came about because of trade, because uh, cities actually formed as trading centers and ideas spread like viruses. So somebody who was building boats would learn about something that somebody was doing building uh, carts, and, and so it was this, this serendipity actually led to an explosion and into why humans dominate the planet. I don't know if I believe that or not, but that's some of the latest stuff. 
uh, theories in anthropology. So uh, I think that to help that process, two things have to happen. One, systems engineers, who are usually the architects of these systems, need to be more than broad across their discipline. They need to be broad, broad. And, and by that, uh, I mean, if you look in my briefcase, I'm reading uh, The Power Broker, which is about politics in New York in the 30s. And I tell you, if you don't think that what we do has some political side to it, um, you should think again. And another book is the Cambridge Lectures uh, by Hawking. And so yeah. I, I think that, first of all, you've got to get out and read what's going on or has gone on uh, across uh, a number of fields. When, when you look at, uh, when you look at new ways of doing things that come into a field, they usually come from another field. So, so you just need to be broad in your reading. But secondly, it's this kind of interaction. It's getting people together and telling their stories about what worked, what doesn't work, this sort of thing. And, and it's, it's like, I mean, I'm so pleased to see uh, having somebody from GM come in and, and speak because, the, I mean, the, the automobile industry is going through a revelation of, 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 of a revolution in innovation right now as they switch to electric vehicles. And you know the thinking of how to how to put all of that together. Uh, so I, it's, it's a really hard question, but I think that um, we're driven because of being engineers uh, to go deep into something. We we have to want to get out and go broad. And, and in fact, the best systems engineers I personally think are, are those that just have an, an immense amount of curiosity. When you go up to something and you see something that has nothing to do with anything you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and you don't understand it, or you don't understand why somebody does it that way. You just have this burning desire to say, gee, I wonder why they did it that way. And so I think it's that desire that sets the best systems engineers apart, that they really don't like anything they don't understand, why somebody did something that way. There's almost always a reason for the irrational or irrationality of humans and it's usually not irrational when you get to the bottom. It's just get to the bottom is really hard. I just have a comment. Uh, I'm working on a JWSC, and I'm the lead a mechanism engineer for optical telescope. And I know that it's a, it's a nightmare for mechanism engineers. That's why you so want the fewest people. number possible. Yes, and because each got 18 segments and each has seven actuators. And not only that, but that portion works on a cryo, but the electronics is on the wall side, on the inner side. The hardest telescope ever been designed. Yes. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I like to have a success because I don't want my name to be on a Washington Post, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a really, uh, I, I think it's a, a we are cutting into the uh, age of technology uh, to drive not only the uh, actuators, but how we can do the radiation-wise, thermal-wise, and electrical-wise that we can drive this mechanism as well as the optics to get the, a better picture of the Hubble. Yeah, James Webb is an incredible, incredible machine. And uh, the, uh, at the end of the day, cryo-actuators of, of the kind of precision that you need are incredibly challenging, never been done before. So that's why, um, having, and knowing that, having built cryo instruments uh, previously, I knew that the minimum number of actuators would be a good thing. So right now it's almost 138 yeah. And most of those are on the, uh, primary, segment. on the primary segments. Uh, there's no story. Talking about connectivity, do you know where the primary segments came from or where? So, I was sitting down, I, I got asked to go over uh, by Ricardo Giacconi, who was head of Space Telescope Science Institute, he was Italian, he got asked to go over to Europe because they had a program over there called the VLT, that was a billion dollars over budget and stuff in year for year. So Ricardo called me up and I went over there. Uh, long story short, uh, one of the major problems with the VLT was the secondary mirror. The secondary mirror had to chop at, at uh, uh, 
like 30 hertz, and basically this eight meter telescope and the secondary mirror is like a meter one and weighs a lot, so when you chop it 20 hertz, it shakes the whole telescope. So we had to do something lighter. They were trying to do it out of silicon carbide, but we couldn't make silicon carbide, and they cracked. I said, well, let's do it out of beryllium. And everybody looked at me like I was an idiot. I said, wow, well, beryllium would be great because it has the lowest Young's module, it has the best Young's modulus, and you can machine it lightweight it. So we made these 1.1 meter beryllium secondaries for the VOT. Uh, we made them on time, on schedule. We put them on the telescope. They chop them. They're lightweight. They're stiff. They don't move. And so when we were sitting in the back room, and Wally said, so what kind of, everybody's using zero doors. I said, well, let's not use zero doors. Let's do the wrong thing. Let's use beryllium. Gee, that'd be really hard. He said, no, no, it's not hard. You go to Brush Wellman, see? So we had developed a supply chain. So you go to Brush Wellman, they got this a spherical hip powder. You can hip it, then you can machine it. And the guys to machine it are down at Axis. It used to be speed reading down in Coleman, Alabama. And they just made these mirrors for the, for the VLT telescope, and they're all set up to go. And then we'll take it out to Tinsley, because Tinsley can actually polish these uh, beryllium. Because when we're out there building the Hubble telescope mirrors, I happened to look in there, and they were building all this beryllium stuff for another customer who will remain nameless. And uh, so, so I know they can do that. So, so here again, it was that serendipity connectivity, because if you tried to go sell a beryllium telescope, and you couldn't point to the fact that there's already, so, I mean, the, the TRL level would have been considered, you know, insane, because we had serendipitously we had developed these beryllium mirrors for another telescope. So, but here you go. So, serendipity. Question here. I guess my question is geared more toward trying to dig out some insights about collaboration versus intellectual property protection. And we're, we're moving into a new era where we're trying to uh, spur the growth of the commercial sector, particularly for space launch. So as we're, as we're starting to think about those things, I know that various companies out there would love to see intellectual property protection on our part so that there could be a competitive advantage for them. That apparently rolls back to what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And yet and still, as systems engineers, we really want to talk about these things because it's the sparks we get from others. Could you share some insights of maybe your spin on where you think NASA could or should be? So the, the question is intellectual property, and it's a great question. Uh, let me start by recommending a book. And the book is called The Birth of Plenty. And it asks the fundamental question, what happened in the late 1700s that caused an acceleration in people's lifestyle uh, worldwide? What happened? What were the things that came together? Because for millions of years before that, I mean, fundamentally, people lived at 99% of people lived at 99.9% of people lived at a subsistence level. So the, the book explores the things that came together that that uh, that changed, revolutionized things. And, and I won't, won't list them all. I'll just tell you one. One was property rights. And basically, if I can have a way where I'm legally protected so that the fruits of my invention are protected, it encourages me to go off and do something. Many systems and countries before that time, if, as a matter of fact, my, my grandfather, uh, my great-grandfather, claims to have invented, and I don't know this, but he claims to have invented the Coleman planter which was a, a seed planter that kind of revolutionized planting and pulled behind. And it was stolen from him. Okay? So uh, that was kind of the, uh, uh, that was kind of the uh, a way that things work. I mean, the law did not protect uh, property rights. Either land or I, particularly ideas. Uh, the, uh, the first telescope actually was patented in uh, 1608 by uh, Hans Lieberhey in the Netherlands. Uh, he didn't get the patent because uh, they said, oh, gee, I just put two pieces. I mean, how could that be? I mean, you, just, you didn't invent anything. You just put two pieces of glass together. Truth of the matter is they saw the military application, and they were hoping to 
keep it quiet because you can uh, spice go. Right. So, so this whole thing about property rights really comes down to a deeper level of uh, you want to share things, right? But when you don't have the ability for companies to have property rights, then you won't get investment from companies. So a company's not going to put a hundred million dollars into something unless they can protect that investment or those ideas uh, in one of two ways. One is trade secrets, so they just don't tell you what they're doing. That doesn't work well in our environment because we want to know what you're doing because we want to know if it's going to work. Because just because you're building a rocket and you may give me the rocket, I'm going to put a billion dollar satellite on it, so I want to know that your rocket is going to be successful. So the way this has kind of worked itself out in our society is in academia, uh, people get rewarded for publishing. So you get tenure because you've shared your ideas, and that's how you get rewarded. In the industrial side, basically, you spend your money, your time, and your investment, and you get intellectual property. And so that's how you get rewarded. Um, I do work, uh, I, I read with a number of universities, and the biggest problem we have with universities is getting the, the property rights to the IRAD worked out. They want to, they, some universities want you to give them money and do the research and then they'll publish it, but it's hard to convince uh, a stockholder that you should give me money so I can give it to somebody else so they can share it with everybody. So, so this is a really hard problem. So, I, however, what, what I believe is is that uh, there's, there's so, the way you approach this is in two levels. One is basic research. You really don't know what the application is. You're doing basic research maybe to get some ahas. And usually when you get basic research, it's the, that's 10% of the problem, getting it to a commercializable, usable form where all the money gets invested. So a lot of times the, the TRL01 things, uh, you know, people will kind of share that because it leads to these serendipitous things and that sort of thing. But above that, it's very hard to do. I don't know how you do it because you got to tell me what the incentive is. Because there's certainly an incentive on the user side uh, to get as much free stuff as you can, but that incentive is a little short-sighted because what you really want to do is have companies invest either their own money or their own IRAD or if nothing, if nothing else than their A team to, to be working on your problem. But if they don't walk away with something from that, they have a hard time explaining it to the people who pay their salaries or to the shareholders this is important. It's a really interesting problem. And the only way I've seen it really work in the long term is uh, at the end of the day, somebody has to walk out with something that uh, has either a trade secret or, a, uh, or an IP, uh, intellectual property to it. Uh, otherwise, it's like the Coleman Planner. If you think you're going to invest all of your time and effort into this, and then you will have no fruits of your labor at the other side, it will stifle creativity and innovation. At least that's what the birth of plenty says. Second speaker today is uh, Mr. Robert Metallic. He's uh, the senior staff research engineer uh, at General Motors. Uh, worked a lot on the advanced technology vehicle concepts, uh, including the high wire concept. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but uh, uh, if you Google it online, there's some great videos of it. Uh, Drive-by wire, uh, fuel cell propulsion. Uh, I followed that up with some work on the appropriately titled sequel uh, hydrogen uh, vehicle that uh, was the first to travel 300 miles on a single tank of uh, hydrogen. Interesting there. And uh, currently, he's working on extensions of those uh, fully electronic vehicles uh, with autonomous control. So uh, please welcome Robert. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and present to this uh, prestigious group. Um, when I got the call from my boss, who actually couldn't make it today because he was flying in from Shanghai, um, asked me if I could come in and talk about some of our projects and some of the concept processes we do with the General Motors, I jumped at the chance. What I want to do today is bring things down from the Hubble level down to the ground level and talk about uh, some of the things that we do at General Motors. And it's great to talk to a sister division, by the way. Um, but uh, basically what we, uh, 
what we have within the corporation is a, is a process by which we go through and we look at a lot of ideations. And where do ideas come from? I'm sure that in the process of going through your program here, you run through those issues and those questions all the time. Where do the ideas generate from? How do they get started? How do they get grown? How do they get wrapped around? How do they get produced? And how do they get promoted? So basically what we do within the company is start with the concept initiation. This is a very fundamental term every engineer and everyone developed or working in engineering understands and starts to learn through experience. I've been uh, with General Motors 34 years. I started at R&D uh, back in 1976 and grew with the company and learned quite a bit about, about this uh, type of approach. I also am a double E by, uh, by uh, uh, academia and training. But during the process of my 34 years, I learned to be an Emmy, I learned to be a manager, I learned to be a promoter, I learned to be a marketer, and I learned to be quality. So I sort of kind of have been fortunate to wrap a lot of those areas within my, uh, within my understanding. So where do we start within GM? We start with a kernel or an idea. And that kernel generates uh, a lot of talk, a lot of buzz among different groups. The kernel generated in from any number of sources. Many times it comes from leadership. And leadership being our directors, our, anywhere from our board of directors down to our immediate bosses. It comes from engineering that says, that had the aha moment that we discovered something or we thought of something that can fix an issue or enhance an issue. It can come from marketing. Our marketing department within General Motors, like any automotive company, constantly looks at what the competition is doing and what the customer and what the trend mark, market trends are doing. And sometimes it comes from customers. General Motors, for a number of years, has an open policy of, of looking at ideations or ideas sent in by customer base. And we have recently, since we've reorganized after our uh, bankruptcy last year, we've really, and you've probably seen this in the media, we really have hyped up our interface with customers significantly to the point where our North American president, Mark Rice, is out at dealerships talking to customers on base levels, getting ideas and getting input and feedback. So this kernel, or these set of kernels or set of ideas, are sort of kind of gathered together, and much like I was listening to when I got here earlier today, gets into uh, generating different ideas, or brainstorming. Everybody knows the term brainstorming. Every engineer knows the term brainstorming. We go through, we look at those ideations, and we build variants around those. So we take a single idea and we tear it apart. We try to see how many fathoms there are to that, to that idea. And what are the variants approaching? What do they, what do they work with? Do they uh, approach technology? Do they define a need or satisfy a need? Do they look at performance or customer experience? So unlike your organization, you have a, a pretty finite set of customers. Whereas with an automotive company, we have a very wide base set of customers. Everybody that drives a Cobalt to a Cadillac. So there's a number of ideas that we, that we look to, to brainstorm to satisfy that uh, wide bandwidth. After we've gone through a number of brainstorming processes, and I've done brainstorming sessions, which everybody here has done, they've lasted a half a day or they've lasted a full week, depending on the bandwidth of the ideations that we were developing and the areas of the corporation or the product that they would get. Once we get past that phase, we go through what's called down selection, and we allow the, the really premier ideations or innovations to start to bubble up to the top. And at that point in time, we sort of kind of garner these and template them, and we start a project initiation, or we begin our project to start scoping out how we can move these ideas, ideas uh, for these uh, new innovations forward. So the most feasible solutions we look at can, these are just three bullets I've just sort of arbitrarily picked. They can be new technologies, they can be benefits, or they can be viability. But there's many other bullets out there that can support the development or down selection of the, of the, of the brainstorming areas. We use a little process called the three I's. Insight, invention, and integration. These three eyes are what we start to build our project around. We start with our insight. 
in this case, understanding our customers, understanding their needs, understanding their wants, understanding ideas that come from uh, customer-based approaches. From insight, we move into invention. We know if we have a series of, of ideas that are sort of kind of already been out there a little bit, and we want to expand on them and maybe apply them to a new product, uh, then we can go into and looking at how those meet or how those match with unmet needs. Uh, we do search, invent, and share. So the invention process is, is, is pretty innate within the corporation from the standpoint of we do a uh, number of templates, but we also look at how the innovation can benefit very, very far visions. And then once we get past that area, we get into integration. As was stated before, you really don't get into understanding until you build hardware. Until you build the items and you have the touch, feel, understanding, and characterization of the systems, whether they be a subsystem or a complete holistic system. So we at General Motors try to, to live by much of this approach. This is not that old. This, is, this whole area of approach is only about 15 years old. It was developed back in the uh, mid-90s, late-90s, where we started to learn that if we looked far enough in the future, and it was interesting because as I was sitting over here uh, earlier in the afternoon before your session, I heard the term look 20, 30 years ahead in a vision. And that's basically what we have been doing for the last 15 years is try to identify and get our arms wrapped around what our industry would be like 15, 20, 25 years from now. So once we go through this, let's take this and sort of kind of matrix it out and look how we format our template of project within, the, within General Motors. We talked about the three eyes. So we start with, we start first with insight and we put a time frame on that anywhere from three to five months. We do our research. We go out and we have different groups that support the corporation do different uh, types of research. And this is what we call our learn portion of our, of our cycle, our learn, create, build cycle. So we look at this and we go through and we define future opportunity for space of the ideations that have been generated. We start to identify critical skills needed for the project. Who do we need at this portion of the problem? We talked about bringing team members in. So we bring people that are good in strategy, people that are good at knowledge synthesis, and people that are good with customers. We also, at this point in time, look at, at suppliers, outside suppliers. And we also begin to form our team. One of the things that we've learned uh, within General Motors, and I know I've learned explicitly, is that when you bring team members together, you often bring people together that come that wear a mask or a filter over their over their brains. Okay? I heard the term working out of the sandbox or working outside the box. If you're going to do innovation, you have to break down the box and get rid of the sand altogether. The problem is that we understand people come into a team that are brought together from all different parts of the company, and many of them wear these face masks like they're swordsmen. And these masks ask act as filters, and those filters are based on experience, understanding, academic backgrounds, uh, and even their own personal outlook on life. Many of you, I'm sure, have been inside brainstorming sessions where you come up with an idea and you post it up there and somebody looks at you and goes, you've got to be kidding. It'll never work. It won't happen. It'll never work. Forget it. It's not going to work. Okay? It's those type of people that don't allow that filter to fail, or that mask to fail, and allow the ideas to flow in and try to get their arms around them to try and see if they can go through the innovative process. After the insight portion, we move into invention. Now, two to four months seems like a very short amount of time for invention, but that's just a, an arbitrary statement. Sometimes invention can go anywhere from six months to a year, depending on the complication and breadth of the, of the project. Here we create, and we bring again in um, creative solving, creative problem solving people. Now, that's a pretty broad statement, but that creative problem solving group includes engineers, includes designers, includes graphic artists, includes animators, and includes a wide breadth of, of group of people uh, to, in order to support that. 
And then we get our deliverables looking at strategic concepts or we prioritize development. So based on the specific application of the project and the, and the goal for the project, these, this time of invention goes through and sort of marches on into a templated area where we start to find out where we get into the areas of intellectual property, where we get into the areas of innovation, and where we get into the areas of product application. Will this idea fall into a product line, or will this idea fall into a new development altogether, something that's outside the box? Once we get past that area, we start to look at integration. So we get into the build mode. We go through and we start to uh, look at our critical skills of product design and product development. Here we bring in our production people and we say, okay, you people are the, are the experts at building these in a mass approach. Bring costs down, make quality parts, make a mass amount of parts. How can we do this part of the integration to build this specific type of vehicle? At this point in time, we also have deliverables of experience. We make an experience demo, in other words, we make it real. Again, getting back to the touch field part of understanding what's out there. External organizations include fab shop, production capable suppliers. We go outside, we do contractual with suppliers. We try to keep as many of, of our skill sets within the corporation, but because of the situation of the last few years with our economy, and the re, re redevelopment or redevelopment of our company, many of our um, production, outside production suppliers are helping us to go through innovation. And at this point in time of our, of our company, we're also now bringing our suppliers in to the early stages of the development. So sometimes our suppliers will show up at the invention mode or show up even at the insight mode because we utilize some of their skill sets as well. It gets into an issue here during the invention, if you have a supplier in to do IP. And getting involved with a supplier to do IP can bring into many conflicting issues based on how the contracts are written. So once we get past the integration stage, uh, let me talk one more thing about, uh, before I leave this, is we talk about team and resources. Many of the teams that are assembled to do these specific types of projects have two types of characters in them. We have a core team, and we have a support team. The core team is assigned by leadership, and um, the acronym is Program Manager, Lead Engineer, Design Manager, Lead Designer, Analyst, and Graphics Specialist, are all the type of people that will stay on the project from start to finish. Then we rotate people in from different support areas to allow to get support from areas that we need specific critical skills, such as, for example, the Insight. GPR is our Global Product Research Team. A TI is a total integration engineer. Uh, CI is a, a climatic engineer, in, integrator. And then we have a trends analysis. When we get over to invention, we bring in a design engineer, designer, animator, graphics, and knowledge management. And then as we get into our integration, we get in again to design engineer, designers, packaging, animator, and graphics. Did you have to understand that many of these subsystems that are being developed inside this framework can include hardware, software, graphics, human machine interface, propulsion, electrics, networking, just a wide bandwidth of, of um, subsystems that we have to integrate. If we take that matrix and build it into sort of kind of a circular motion, we've come up with this little design that we developed about five years ago called user-centered design innovation. It begins at the centroid of the, of the matrix, where we start with product scoping. As we go through the rotation, we did, the, we did that learn, we did that create, and we did that build. This circles around all three of those. So as we go through and develop specific ideations and innovations, we continually rotate within this matrix. At a certain level, the ideation will do one of two things. It will fall off and get tabled and said, okay, we can't do it. Let's not waste any more time or money on it. Or we'll move out into the next generation or the next level. And as it gets wider and wider in this, in this uh, learn, create, and build uh, 
circle, it starts to end up towards its product implementation. So we go through, we do project scoping, we look at ethnographic concept generation, we build functional mock-ups, we get user feedback. We actually will do clinics. We'll take a mock-up that's only partially designed, and we'll take it out and we'll showcase it to the public, or we'll showcase, showcase it to a specific sect in the market, and allow them to look at it and allow them to give us feedback. That helps us to continue the process. As we move out, we refine the concept, go into build production with feasible proof of concept, and if that proves positive, it makes its way all the way up to product implementation. At that stage of product implementation, what happens is the ideation of the project gets handed off to a brand new group, a brand new set of, of engineers and support personnel. At that point, it gets moved into production. We are here to develop the ideas and generate the ideas from proof of theory all the way to proof of concept. And once that gets accepted, and it's usually deemed by our leadership as the go, no go from their standpoint, it gets handed off to our production people where they go through and take it into development. Because they have to develop, they have to make it cost effective, they have to make quality, and they have to do it in mass. So these are just some, some little sidelights, some, some of the things that have been worked on over, over a number of projects over the last few years. We had one up here where we had customers who said, what can we do to our SUVs to help them with their dogs? They want to be able to have something so that the dogs, they can carry the, their animals. And, and Who in here doesn't love their animals? Okay. And we had customers say, well, you know, what can we do to help the animal in the back of the SUV? Can, we want to design some sort of a platform for them. We want to make it easier for them to get in and out of the vehicle. So we actually designed a ramp system that fits in the back of a tailgate that can easily fold out. And as it turned out from that process, we actually developed a two-fold idea. One, the idea of the ramp works to help the animal or the dog get up into the, into the back of the vehicle. The second is, if you leave it in place and fold it down, it now becomes a secondary table if you're tailgating. Okay? So those are the kinds of things that sort of kind of blow, blow out and give us the ideations. So here, you can see we get a picture of the design of the ramp here. And then here it's in position as that, as, a, uh, as a, a ramp. So these are the kinds of interfaces that we have within the ideation generation. So we learn as we go. We learn our mistakes. We use our mistakes because to fail is normal. You always will fail. You will fail, but you fail to learn. That's the key. Work is enabled by building a team. In our case, in General Motors, we have a global network of team support in our process. We have design, which is our major portion, which puts the finishing touches that makes you, the customer, like the way it looks. One of our former leaders, Mr. Robert Lutz, always said that if a car doesn't look good, somebody, the customer is not going to bother getting into it. Okay? Next is planning. We need to look at long-term planning and strategic ideation of what's going to happen 10 years in the industry from now. We do that by watching our customers, watching our competitors, and watching ourselves. Next, we have a group called the Advanced Vehicle Development Center, Global Technical Engineering, R&D and Engineering, which I'm part of, that all work together on a global basis. That includes our, our Opal division, that includes our North American division, that includes our China division, and includes our Holden division down in Australia. So people will build a team, or the leadership will build a team together using personnel for all of these different structures. Advanced purchasing, very important part of the team. If we have to go out and do contracts with suppliers, and we need to do competitive contracts with suppliers, advanced purchasing, which is a totally separate group from normal purchasing within the company, goes out and has the skill sets to negotiate quality contracts at a, at a reasonable price, at a reasonable cost. Strategic marketing, very important to understand where we're going to be within five, ten years from now. So marketing looks at all of those aspects. Regional innovation groups, every region has an idea or an innovation group for their particular market. We build a car for North America, it's not going to sell in Mexico. Okay. When we built the Nova, 
Everybody remember the Nova? Okay. You know what Nova in Mex? You know what uh, uh, Nova in Mexico means? Don't go. Okay. That was just a good example of the fact that whoever did the strategic planning of that or the marketing of that didn't do the research, didn't do the network. Okay. So. These regional innovation groups help us to understand what the specific region, if we're building or designing a vehicle for that particular market, such as our China market right now, we have a complete set of group of people over there that are specifically expertise in their region. Global product research. We watch our competition. We watch our competition very closely. And you would be amazed to understand what we do within our own OEM um, areas. Um, there was a point in time when I was, uh, part of my job was doing competitive assessment. And I remember when I was doing uh, teardowns, I, uh, we bought a Prius, 1997 Prius, right hand drive, bought it right from Japan, not even the United States yet. And we did it to do a competitive assessment on, on their technology and how, and how they work. Um, that Prius, and if you drive a Prius, please don't take this the wrong way. My oldest son, who's a double league, works for Toyota. Talk about our dinner conversations. Okay. This Prius couldn't get out of its own way. It was a rattle trap. It was noisy. It was terrible on performance. It was a right-hand drive. It was just, it was unbelievable. Well, Toyota actually finally understood that the American market would not approve of that vehicle because of its performance. So they held off its introduction over a year and a half to bring, to bring it more into what the U.S. customer would like. Chrysler, when they first brought out the PT Cruiser, came to us and said, hey, we'd like to take a look at your Corvette. We'll swap you a Cruiser for a Corvette. We did. We dropped off a Corvette at Chrysler, and they dropped off the PT at us, and we went through and did our, our own analysis. Things like that have been going on for a number of years, although the public doesn't know. But it helps because the OEMs, such as Chrysler, Ford, and GM, all watch each other very closely. And it's now to the point where we're all watching each other's backs closely. Technology planning. What technology do we need to use? Okay. A good example uh, between Ford and GM, for example, and I use this all the time, is Ford has come up with Sync. Now, Sync is a very popular addition to the vehicle. Who here has one inside the vehicle? Okay. Do you like it? Are you happy with it? You love it. Okay. They they did it right because they went to Microsoft and, and had them build it for them. Okay? Who in here has GM products? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I can now afford the plane ride home. Okay? <laughs> have you ever used your OnStar? Okay. OnStar has been around for over a decade and it's been touted as one of the best telematics. It's won just won several awards last year as being the best telematics development because not only do we provide customer safety for our customers, we provide service for our customers in the concierge, we provide um, safety in crash notification, we can unlock your doors, and now we've added diagnostics. So if you're driving down the road and your check engine light comes on, you can go online to OnStar and they can tell you exactly what's wrong and they can tell you whether A, you can continue driving, or B, if you need to pull over or to get to a service station. OnStar um, is, 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 and this is not a sales pitch, but OnStar has been just a, a huge development source or base for us within the corporation to, to take telematics to the next level. And that comes into technology planning. Competitor technology intelligence, I just talked about that a little bit. We're constantly looking at each other. And then finally, looking at strategic initiatives. Where does the leadership of our company want to see want to see us go within the next 20 years? Um, as of last year, it was just trying to make it through the next 12 months. Okay. So with that, let me sort of kind of just summarize very quickly. I heard this word come up before: collaboration. Collaboration is used exclusively within the corporation to promote creativity and teamwork, leverage multiple expertise, and ensure customer buy-in. Customer insight, gain understanding of the customer. Now, the word customer, you know, if I say I work for an automotive company and I say customer, the first thing you think about is yourselves. There are customers internal to GM as well. If we develop a new control system that we feel is advantageous for our powertrain division, our powertrain division becomes our customer internally. 
if we design a new control system to give you better performance in ADS brake controls, then the braking system, the braking group, becomes our customer. So we have internal customers as well within the corporation that comes from, that helps us to go through our development process. Innovation from Insight provides solutions that will resonate with consumers rather than technology for technology's sake. And I heard this data before. You don't want to put technology just because it's, it's technologically better than anybody else. If the customer derives satisfaction out of it, it enhances their experience, then it's worth it. If it's there just because it's a new tech process, it's not worth it. And then finally, a demonstrator iteration. It makes the development process faster and more effective through cycles of learning, going back to that learn, build, or learn, create, build cycle, and then building the mule properties to validate the theoretical. And that's where I'm going to sort of kind of use this term roughly segue into the next part of my presentation. Uh, back, in 1990, back in 1999, I got a phone call from my uh, director, uh, Dr. Lawrence Burns, who was uh, VP of R&D for a number of years. Um, and it's kind of funny because I actually uh, was an engineer working on powertrain controls back in the early 70s when uh, Dr. Burns got hired in. And he actually worked with me, and I, I sort of kind of mentored him for a little bit. Um, but... Um, he uh, went, through the, uh, went through the ranks of the corporation, and Dr. Burns was a visionary. He was a visionary in the respect that he looked outward 20, 30 years for the corporation to understand where GM needed to go from the standpoint of clean energy. The fact of the matter is that the internal combustion engine has been around here for over 100 years. It's been well refined. But the fact of the matter is, too, is that we can see right now with the issue that we're suffering through from the Gulf of Mexico is that we need to move away from oil. Now, engines are not going to disappear. They'll be around for 10 years, they'll be around for 15, probably 25 years. But they're going to become more refined. They're going to become cleaner, and they're now going to become part of a propulsion system as to being only a propulsion system. So with that first call I got in 1999, we put together a team uh, he hired a uh, young PhD from Chrysler called uh, uh, Dr. Chris Perlman-Bird, who was working on fuel cells for Chrysler at the time, and wanted to do some very unique uh, development. But Chrysler said no, they didn't want to, they didn't want to put the money or time into it. So Dr. Burns uh, hired Chris, who's now my boss, and we started to put together a vision. And that vision was basically reinventing the automobile. And I'm sure many of you have heard this term uh, reiterated in press and media for General Motors over the time. But Dr. Burns had a very focused vision on what he wanted to do. And both Chris and his team, myself and three other engineers, took that vision and started to build something around it. And the first thing that came out of the process, I'm sorry, before I keep jumping ahead of myself, the four areas that we wanted to build this vision around included advanced propulsion, we wanted to build uh, vehicle electronics, controls, and software that were jump ahead of our competitors, telematics. We want to take the outdoor systems and bring it to a new level. And then advanced materials. With the development of new technologies and materials all the way down to nanoparticles, we felt there was a very viable application for those types of, of materials, which we have been started, we've had started to use and will now start showing up in some of our products in the next couple of years. So the first vision was the autonomy. This was a vehicle that was, or a vision I should say, that incorporated a couple of very fundamental systems. One, the capability to have all of our control systems, propulsion, braking, steering, um, anything doing with controlling the vehicle in the flat chassis. This flat chassis that we reference, we, we sort of kind of nicknamed the skateboard. And the idea is, is that skateboard becomes a self-sustaining property that you can put different body modules on top of it. So what we were doing was looking at how we could advance technology and how we could advance a business model as well. For example, and this is what we you know, sort of kind of built our, our vision around, is the fact that if you are a commuter that drives a certain number of miles a day and you want a small vehicle to drive back and forth or a compact vehicle to drive back and forth, you would have one body on it during the week. You want to take the family out for a, sh a short ride on a weekend, 
you can either own the body or possibly go to a dealer and rent a new body for the weekend and just swap it. So, but again, this was a vision that was 20, 25 years out because none of the technologies existed yet where we could put a propulsion system in a chassis this small. Now, albeit that this is all electric drive, there's no engine in this. In this case, our dream was four wheel motors. And actually, the four wheel motors grew into what we call a dream of an e corner where the e-corner now, now produces uh, active suspension, propulsion, braking, and steering all in one unit. It just sort of kind of hangs off into the body, or off the end of the chassis. So from here, we said, okay, where do we need to go? We talk about systems engineering, we're talking about fuel cell, we're talking about, well, what kind of, what kind of, we knew we need hydrogen, do we use solid, do we use liquid, do we use gas? Oh, by the way, we have to do full electric braking, full electric steering. We have to have several levels of networking in there. We have to be able to have high-speed controls. We have to be able to cool it. We have to be able to heat it. And we have to be able to talk to it. So there was a number of engineers that were brought into the program to uh, wrap their arms around this. What we did was the first iteration. We want to talk about the cycling, the learn, the create, the build. Here's the first iteration that we did. It was called the high wire. The high wire was exactly what we looked at our vision, but we utilized current technology that we had our hands on at this point in time. It was a flat chassis. It incorporated everything that we had in our vision. It included electrical traction system, full by wire systems control, so we had both steering and braking by wire, compressed hydrogen tanks. We ran about one and a half liters of pure compressed hydrogen at about 350 bar. We had a 100 gen refueling system that would, able, that would be able to tell us flow rate inside there as well as temperature so we can keep the hydrogen very stable. We had a fuel cell stack. General Motors has been working on fuel cells for a long time. The first fuel cell vehicle we ever built was in 1969. It was built in the back of a van. And believe me, it was a big stack. <laughs> we have now since targeted, and one of the things that we had from our vision was to build a fuel cell that would give us one kilowatt of energy for one kilogram of mass. And we're, we're close to approaching that now, which is a pretty, pretty, pretty awesome project. Now, NASA's been using fuel cells for a long time. Every one of your orbiters, every one of your onboard vehicles have a fuel cell on them, okay? So this was one of our third or fourth generation stacks we were able to fit with inside. Now this chassis, is 11 inches thick, and it contained everything we need to drive the vehicle. Fire the brakes, air management, cabin heating, universal docking connector. Um, I actually was able to get five patents on different connecting systems that I designed for this vehicle. And then steer by wire, steer by wire steering rack, and body mounts. So we took the vision of the skateboard and put it into reality. So we built an actual running model. The process basically gave our designers a whole world of freedom they would never experienced before. Designers who love to design cars are artists that understand math. Okay? They were given the opportunity, we told them, you can design the interior of the vehicle any way you want. We just need an area that we can sit someone in and that will devise and develop a human machine interface that will allow the, per the person or people to drive the vehicle. So they developed and designed this body, which is completely flat from front to rear. No humps, no wells, nothing. No foot pedals. We took all the foot pedals away, and we gave all the controls to the hands. This particular unit, um, I had a, a, a good deal of design. I had a team uh, of engineers working on this. And basically, this vehicle was driven by twisting for throttle, squeezing these hands for braking, and then we use the cantilever system to, for steering back and forth. When you first think about it, it seems a little bit arcane on how it handles, but it actually handled very well. In order to test our theory, we actually we built a vehicle in Italy. That was fun. Um, we actually brought in a gentleman who had just broken both his legs in the skiing accident, and we asked him to drive the vehicle. We wanted to get his response uh, to how to drive the vehicle because he couldn't use his legs. They, they, they were just broken, they were being, they were, they were going to come back. 
but he drove the vehicle and found it very natural to drive it. We felt it was it was it was really nice to drive. And that gave us a great feeling because we felt we were on the right path. <clears throat> One of the things we did too is we on this vehicle, we told the designers we didn't want any mirrors. There's no mirrors on the vehicle whatsoever. So we developed a camera system. We embedded cameras into the bodies. So we'd have uh, four cyber cyber viewer cameras, were monitors on each each side, and then the center camera or the center display here was a rear view camera. That also sort of kind of gave us an understanding of how people would interpret looking straight down and seeing a rear vision in front of them, how the how the feedback to the brain would add to that. And once they once they tried it, it became very natural. So here is a picture of the body being removed. And again, based on our, on our vision, we were able to design the body so it could lift within 10 minutes and be completely removed, mechanically and, electronic, and electrically. And what I'd like to do now is just give you, well, John will see how well their audio works, is give you a couple of videos. time for you. I would eventually say it's making, it's making its first initial orbit. Okay? <laughs> um, this was one of the first times that we drove a vehicle in public where we had public and journalists there. The sound you're hearing is actually not the fuel cell, it's the air compressor inside processing the air, atmospheric air, under pressure to, met, to be pressurized in the fuel cell sac to mix with the hydrogen and then go through the process of separation. So the vehicle uh, was, was um, kind of interesting to watch and, and observe as it drove around. Now you have to understand because of this new 11 inch chassis design we had, we really didn't do a great deal to look at handling the capabilities inside the vehicle from the standpoint of how it, uh, of how it handled compared to a production vehicle. This vehicle only had about an 80 mile range and we electronically doubled its speed to about 45 miles an hour. We were going to let journalists drive this vehicle and other people wanted to make sure they didn't, they didn't get uh, too carried away. This next video is of a couple of young engineers. Oops, where'd they go? Okay, what happened here? Let's close this guy. We rented a, uh, an abandoned airstrip in France and we built a course to drive the vehicle on to sort of kind of test its capabilities from acceleration and uh, maneuverability as well as handling. So as you can see, the steering system is just a cantilever approach. These two guys are having a ball. We couldn't get them out of They were just having too much fun. They ran it right out of hydrogen. The vehicle had um, the vehicle had no lithium-ion batteries or battery systems on it. The total, the fuel cell was the total source of energy on the vehicle. So it had a very poor performance. It took almost 14 seconds to go from zero to 45 miles an hour, and that's totally unacceptable by any driver. Okay, but it was only a partial iteration of the theory. It was only the first level of development. Once we 
were successful, we actually built two, we built two chassis. We built two chassis in one body. And we actually did this complete project in 19 months, which was, which was really an excessive, uh, or I should say an aggressive project. And what we did is we had one chassis go down a pathway to develop all the propulsion system, and we had one chassis go down the pathway to develop all of the controls and, and electronics and networking so that we could merge them together as we got closer to getting everything developed up to a certain level, blend everything together under one chassis, and have it work. And that, that process worked rather well for us. So you want to talk about bringing several groups of system engineers and support engineers together to work as a team. This was very, this was very critical. The, the, the chassis was built um, with cooperation from a company called EDAG and our, and our sister division in uh, Mainz Castell in Germany. And the body was built by a coach builder called Steve Bertoni in Italy, in Torino, where we had the coach. So we, we would be, the teams would be flying back and forth between the two cities as we were going through the project development and completion to make sure everything stayed on track. The high wire was a great success from the standpoint of what we wanted to achieve, but it wasn't where we wanted to go. We still wanted to need to go a lot further. The second iteration of the vehicle, of the process of the project, was the sequel. This vehicle, we wanted to ensure that we had several areas of ideation that were thought about and started in the high wire, but we wanted to bring it to fruition in the sequel. That included we want better performance, 0 to 60 in 9 seconds. We wanted 300 mile range, and we wanted it to drive just like a production vehicle. We wanted to ensure that when somebody got into it, they couldn't tell the difference between this or Malibu they bought off a lot. So with that, let me just give you a quick was the culmination of all the work we did on the high wire plus another three years worth of work on this particular project. We did, it took us three years to do this project because we basically were looking at the fact that we wanted something that was completely roadworthy, had all the amenities of a standard vehicle, and when somebody got in to drive it, they didn't feel any different than they were driving a normal production car. This, however, did have a complete set of different metrics. It had zero to 60 in eight and a half seconds. It had um, eight liters of hydrogen on board, compressed at 700 bar to give us a 300 mile range. It had all wheels steer and all wheel drive. So all four wheels steered independently, I should say independently, but based on our control algorithms. The rear uh, wheels had six degrees of freedom and the front wheels had a full 35 degrees of freedom. We had all wheel drive where we moved forward taking just a single axle traction motor and we included two rear wheel motors as well. It had a lithium ion battery pack on it, which was about four and a half kilowatts. So we took all the things we wanted to do and built it into this, into this product. Uh, we built two of these and they ran for almost three and a half years uh, going around the world to different, to, to different venues. Uh, one sits in China Automobile Museum right now and the other one sits in our other museum in, uh, in Warren. The team, getting back to our, uh, our sequel team, uh, comprised uh, people from around the globe that were involved in the project. Again, we utilized our uh, Opal division, which has the expertise in fuel cells, and is now, uh, many, of those, many of those engineers have moved to our uh, New York subsidy, which is where we build all of our fuel cell stacks now. The program was so successful that after the completion of the sequel, leadership in the corporation decided to uh, expand it a little bit further. 
So we developed a uh, GM project driveway, which was a uh, hydrogen powered vehicle. We built 100 vehicles, and this was back in 2008. We built 100 vehicles, and those fleet of 100 vehicles have, have logged over a million and a half, or one and a half million miles successful. You may have even seen them driving around Washington, because Washington is one area where we've had them staged as well as the West Coast. Um, and right now, the next uh, level of the program is uh, General Motors, Chrysler, and another OEM have signed a agreement with the state of Hawaii and the gas company in Hawaii. We're going to build an infrastructure of refueling stations to start testing the capability and potential of building uh, fueling stations for a fleet of vehicles. And Hawaii seems like the perfect place to do it. I applied for the job, they wouldn't do it. <laughs> I got sent to China instead. What did I do wrong? Okay. So with that, what I'd like to do is move into the next set of the next project that I've been involved with, uh, the electric network vehicles. This uh, is a project that was developed uh, specifically for the World Expo in Shanghai. GM has a pavilion out there, and uh, our leadership wanted to take, i.e. Uh, Dr. Burns and my boss, wanted to take the next step from the, from the, the hydrogen approach and go to a full electric system. So the ENVs were developed, electric network vehicles were developed, but we wanted to go a little bit further and sort of kind of fall outside the sandbox right into the gravel pit. These vehicles travel on two wheels. They don't travel on four, okay? We went and talked about going into a cooperative program. We went into a program with Segway Corporation. And everybody, has anybody here ever driven a PT in Segway? Okay. We took that theoretical, or we took that actual operational system and developed it into a larger package and a better control package that we could run a vehicle that contained two people that will drive, um, that will drive uh, in, this, in these vehicles. We have three variations, and I have a, a video that will talk about that real quickly. But let me just talk about, before I get into that video, let me talk about where we're going with the, the DNA or the reinvention of the automobile. Again, we look at many of the current DNA that we, we look. We currently use energized pulp petroleum, powered mechanically by an engine, controlled mechanically, standalone, totally independent, totally dependent on driver and vehicle size for maximum use of people and cargo. Where we're going, or where we have been going over the last decade into the new, new DNA is energized by electricity and hydrogen, powered by electrically by electric motors, controlled electronically, connected. This is a very key next level for telematics. And then also semi and full autonomous driving, which I'll talk about in a moment, as well as vehicles tailored specifically to specific use. This is especially interesting right here because we're going to put this in production in November when the vehicle, the Volt, comes out. The vehicle, the Volt, the Volt vehicle is totally powered by electric motors. Even though it has a small engine on it, that engine has absolutely zero to do with propulsion on the road other than to maintain battery charge and provide onboard power to the rest of the, uh, the systems. So it acts as a genset on the vehicle. I'm sure everyone here can relate to that. Full propulsion is controlled, is, is driven by the uh, by electric motors, and there is no mechanical connection between the engine and the wheels whatsoever. The engine only runs at two speeds. It runs at a low idle condition, or it runs at a specific fixed speed for the generators, for the generator set. Getting back to talking about the autonomous approach, one of the things we've, we've done on the, end of the, on the electric network vehicle is build in the capability to understand where I am, what's around me, and take me where I want to go. We have onboard GPS systems and digital map systems inside of our, of our onboard computers that tell the vehicle knows exactly where it's at in reference to uh, its position on Earth, GPS plus some other technology. What's around me, it has the capability to sense both visually ultrasonic, LIDAR, as well as connection between one vehicle to another, transmitting data back and forth of where they're at. And then taking where I want to go, the capability to program the vehicles where you would like to have them take you, and then follow a specific path, obey all the traffic rules, and uh, deliver you to your place in, in a safe mode. We also, on the MV vehicles, 
designed a interface for a smartphone so that you basically can have the smartphone and call the vehicle when you need it. So if it's parked in the parking garage three blocks away, you can get on your phone, talk to it, tell it, come on, get me, I'm ready to go to work. It will wake up, pull out of its... This is not, this is not theory. We have, we have exercised this. It will wake up, drive down the pathway, and you can see on your phone where it's at because it will have a, an overlaid map. It will also show you vehicle speed, uh, battery state of charge, and any other thing it wants to tell you, like, you know, maybe we need to, you know, the cup holders are dirty or something like that. So we, we've taken that level of, of approach to, to, um, to do this. Here's an interior shot of the vehicles. Um, one of the things, again, here is it's, it's a fully electric system. We have deployable HMI systems here. And again, we went, we went back to the very same premise we did with the high wire, uh, was where we have all the controls in hand. We have uh, steering, throttle, uh, and reverse. And these are deployable. These are left-hand and right-hand drive as well. Well, the one thing I didn't mention was on the high wire, with the push of a button, that whole HMI system goes from left-hand drive to right-hand drive. So we allowed it to be utilized in almost any country. So, by wire deployable, autonomous drive capability. Well, you can autonomously drive while you're sitting in it as well. Unique interior for two passengers, small footprint, full electric, full circle turn on axis. We don't need reverse. You can turn on axis, turn on dynamic. These particular vehicles have a 40 kilometer range and a 40 kph speed limit. Full telematics with onboard cameras and sensors. One of the things we also allowed to do is that we said, okay, if you're driving autonomously, what are you going to do? You can read a book? Watch a movie? Well, we can also we develop a video chat system where you can talk to another vehicle. You can talk to three vehicles at once, or you can talk to three vehicles and someone that's at home through their, through their system. So we built that capability in as well. We exercise that capability. Full connectivity, B2B, video chat, IB, and mapping. One of the things that we're looking at in the next advancement of technology for telematics is the capability for vehicles to understand their environment, okay? What's going on in traffic patterns three cars ahead, three miles ahead? How often are you in a situation in driving that all of a sudden traffic stops, but you have no idea what's going on? The approach we've taken is that with what we call V2V, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle interface connectivity, is that if a vehicle is at the front of, say, this traffic jam, it can broadcast situation or broadcast information either to the other vehicles or to the infrastructure, infrastructure being the government, okay? In other words, everything that's like all the way down the pathway of the roadway. And then a smartphone interface. Okay, with that, I'd like to show you just one real quick. Imagine a vehicle that is smart enough to drive itself. GM's Electrical Network Vehicles, or MVs, explore the idea of autonomous driving by connecting with other vehicles on the road, which allows for safe and connected transportation. The easiest way to see how all of the conceptual pieces come to life is in the build of the vehicle itself. GM has manufactured three variations of the MV each targeted at urban markets around the world. The Miao, Jiao, and Xia each have their own look, <laughs> style, and personality. I won't do the While the design may point. vary from one model of the Envy to the next, the hardware and technology is essentially identical. At GM's design center in Warren, Michigan, the Envy teams are working to bring the concept to life. The manufacturing process is an ambitious one, but the fabrication teams embraced the challenge. Because of the Envy's functionality, the building materials must be extremely light. That's why the team uses carbon fiber and advanced plastics for most of the vehicle's body. Paint and all materials are actual production based and will wear well during the six months of use in the Expo Pavilion. The MV's composite carbon fiber shells are molded to match the specific design of each vehicle. 
All in all, the shell will weigh only about 70 pounds, considerably lighter than any conventional vehicle. Numerous components of the vehicle, from the hinges to the interior panels, are made of advanced plastics instead of aluminum. Not only does this reduce weight, but plastic parts can be manufactured in days instead of weeks, saving valuable time in the production process. The envies will be pieced together at a framing station. This is where one of many quality checks takes place to ensure proper functionality of the vehicle's many components. The three variants are beginning to take shape. The assembled shapes look like futuristic bullet trains and mini helicopters. As the complex parts of the vehicle are added in the manufacturing process, the unique characteristics of the MV become more evident. The MV reimagines some of the most basic components of a vehicle, from the door to the seats. Meow has the look and feel of a mysterious, high-technology autonomous robot. The Zhao has the flair and excitement of a European couture collection. And the Xiao expresses happiness, joy, and sunny optimism. Once the body is near completion and mounted to its drive system, the vehicle is ready to undergo a series of vigorous tests on durability, handling, and vehicle communications. The Envies will make their world debut at the World Expo 2010 Shanghai and will show the world GM's vision for the future of urban transportation. What is currently uh, uh, been developed is we have uh, two uh, R2A and R2B, which are basically um, uh, robotic systems with over, I think it's 42 degrees of freedom with the capability to do many, many things. Uh, the arms themselves have the capability of lifting 25 pounds, 25 or 30 pounds in the order. So this has been something that we've been, uh, we've been working with, uh, with NASA since 2007, and I believe it's a five-year contract or five-year program. And I'm sure that uh, you'll be hearing more about this if not, uh, if you haven't already, I'm sure. Is there anybody here that's been involved in that program at all, uh, intimately? Okay. Um, so it's, it's, you know, this is, a couple of my colleagues have been involved in this, so I've been, uh, I've been sort of kind of on, on the edge listening all the time to what's going on and see where we're going with this. So I know that the, 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 the project was developed to allow, to do two things. One, because uh, General Motors was looking to take their next level of technology and plan operations from just simple robots that we have now into more articulating systems that would help better benefit production quality and production application. And I think I believe that NASA's uh, look at this is also to uh, look at the capability to put uh, one of these in space to work with next to the astronauts to help them out as well. So we haven't done feet yet. Uh, we just did the torso. So with that, I'd like to thank you and also congratulate you on, on completing your program. Thank you. <laughs>